It's time for Arrested DevOps, the podcast where we help you achieve understanding, develop good practices, and operate your team and organization for maximum DevOps awesomeness. I'm Bridget Kremhout, and show notes for today's episode can be found at arresteddevops.com slash DevOps dash weekly. Before I intro today's special guest, a word from our sponsors. Okay, so today's guest has shaped your perceptions of DevOps for years, whether you know it or not. So I'm so happy to welcome to the show, Gareth Rushgrove. Gareth, can you tell our listeners a little about yourself? Yeah, sure. Sort of some overwhelming introduction. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm Gareth Rushgrove. I'm basically Gareth R in most places on the internet. Um, I'm currently a product manager at Docker, previously worked at Puppet, and before that I was uh, doing a bunch of sort of operations and development stuff at the UK government. Uh, I also curate the DevOps Weekly newsletter, which I think some people are keen on as well. <laughs> some people, yeah. Let's let's talk about that. So we're using the newsletter as a framing device. So like, let's start there. I'm curious if you can tell our listeners, how on earth did you start emailing <laughs> loads of people every Sunday and why do you keep doing it? Like, for how many years is this? <laughs> yeah, so and at this point, it's seven plus years, like 360 issues or some some large number. <laughs> I've and how many um, people are you emailing every week? <laughs> about 25,000, 26,000 people, like subscribers. <laughs> um, it's definitely one of those things, sort of side projects that got out of hand more than anything else. Um, <laughs> and Cautionary I, tale. And it, it goes back to, I guess, certain moment in time i'm actually like yeah I mean, like sort of seven eight years ago like sort of patrick ran devops days in belgium i wasn't there but one of my uh sort of colleagues at the time uh dean wilson um uh went along to it came back and said like you would have really liked that that sort of got me like the word and a bunch of people i was at the second devops days uh, in sort of hamburg mm -hmm. um met a bunch of people through that at the same time, I was doing a bunch of Ruby programming. Um, Peter Cooper had started out uh, with the Ruby Weekly email, and that was novel. This was like we were going back to like someone was sending an email newsletter, and it was curated once a week, and this was quite nice. And I and just the confluence of those things of being interested. I, I, I'd been doing sort of bits of operation stuff, bits of automation, bits of sort of software development. That was my sort of background. Um, but we had this banner of DevOps suddenly, and a group of people who were also super enthusiastic about something I, I was interested in. And I was like, well, I'll just start collecting a bunch of things I'm already reading and putting them together for other people to read. Um, That's to how start, it starts. <laughs> yeah. And, and to start with, I mean, if you go back to like, to like the first issue, which I think was issue zero, um, <laughs> of course. there's like at that point, like it wasn't on Sundays. It wasn't actually weekly because I did. I, I had no like. I, I didn't always have enough content. I didn't have like a process of actually doing it. It's like there'd be gaps. Um, but a bunch of people like subscribed, and I just kept sending it. Um, and at, so over time, I think in order to keep myself sort of able to keep doing it, I. I sort of said, well, actually, no, I, I need a day that I do it. And I tried a few different things, and Sunday stuck. And it's been Sunday for six to eight, six odd years. Um, and again, I, I like getting into a regular habit, like made it easier for me to do. But also, I think people stuck with it more because it was it was literally then every week. Yeah, yeah. People um, people like consistency. Like Stratton is always telling me, we need to put the podcast yes. out on a more consistent um, schedule. And I'm like, yeah, but that I, sounds disappointing I think, and difficult. I, I think it's definitely one of those things where like it helps me do it. So it helps me curate it. And they're like, I, I I spend my time like a fixed time on Sunday like morning, and it goes out. And a bunch of people, the sort of feedback I get often is like. Oh yeah, I have it with my coffee. If they're in, like, <laughs> they, they have it with their breakfast. If they're in, like, New York, um, or they read it on, they read it first thing Monday morning. If they're in Australia, and like, I get all these like different variants of like, yeah, it fits into my schedule, so that's how I consume it, and it's interesting. 
Oh, that's awesome. But I remember um, at DevOps Days in Ghent in 2014 <laughs> that you were talking about how you should never put the name weekly in the title of anything. <laughs> Do you still you feel know? that way or is that, is that oh, just a joke? I mean, or? <laughs> it's, it's both. I, I, I think the, yeah, the moment you put the sort of the cadence that weekly, whatever, like you're stuck. <laughs> People like like you've you've set up an expectation that ultimately you can never really change. Um, so actually, if I wanted to do the newsletter every like every fortnight, like I would sort of need to change the name, and that would like actually then people would be like what's this devops fortnightly thing and it'd be like no not that DevOps and you'd have to and you'd have to explain uh -huh. to the americans what a fortnight is and it would just be a whole thing well and are you are you yeah devops bi-weekly and then you go like is that like that means different things in different places like including the cadence of something in the name is is not a great idea having said <laughs> that actually it being there is sort of a social pressure for me to actually make it weekly um and that consistency i think helps like has it helped it grow? I like all of the growth is totally organic. It's just yeah. I I mentioned it on the internet. Um, I've and not done, I, like I've not really done advertising. Um, uh, I get embarrassed at conferences sometimes by like John Osbar, where he's like a big fanboy. Uh, <laughs> or other, so like you can see occasionally like someone will mention it at a conference, and I'll get a bunch of subscribers. And um, but otherwise, it just sort of ticks up. But obviously, that, if that happens over seven years and every week, then it ends up as a larger number. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you mentioned conferences, and of course, you go to a number of them. Um, and I think that you have kind of an interesting perspective, because as you mentioned when you when you uh, joined Freed here on the podcast, that you were at the UK government digital service for a while, then you spent a few years at Puppet. Now you've recently joined Docker. I'm I think maybe our listeners would appreciate if you talk a little about how these gigs that you've been in and maybe other ones too um, shape your perspective in terms of how you see the community. Cause you mentioned this is a curated newsletter, yeah. obviously it's opinionated, it's your opinions. And I'm curious how the environments you've been in have shaped those opinions. Yeah, good question. I think so like for, for, for good and ill, like one of the things that I've ended up doing with and across a number of jobs, like has been they've been quite different. So I've worked for a company where I was the first employee of like two founders. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in like sort of more like uh, sort of marketing agency type, design agency type places. I've worked as an in-house developer at a big radio like sort of uh, station. Mm -hmm. I've worked for the government, which was obviously a weird and b huge. <laughs> um, I've more recently worked for like two more similar companies in terms of like a sort of like uh, sort of growth stage, like te technology vendors. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that yeah, I'm just interested in loads of things, and I think that's come out in like me having worked in different types of organizations. I the downside of that is I, I I'm I'm not going to have as deep an understanding of someone who's like always worked for technology vendors or always worked for like large technology companies or always worked in government but i've sort of like hopefully more than dabbled um like passed through uh, a bunch of these things and i think that perspective is interesting um, yeah i mean i think that that helps probably it helps you see what um your readers from a lot of different backgrounds might find interesting yeah and i said i mean i, I made a sort of an explicit like decision to go work in technology companies, but that wasn't sort of my formative experience. And actually a lot of my, a lot of people I know, whether that's through like the DevOps community or whether that's through like previous jobs or, or other communities I've been part of, have invariably been more on the actual, like the user side, mm -hmm. the consumer. Um, and sort of, I think that's useful and interesting. Like I, I, I did that on purpose, but I think I didn't realize how interesting I would find doing so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so when you're curating this news, you know, whatever you're finding notable, you know, newsworthy to share, I'm kind of curious if we have to consider a little bit of an observer effect here, because totally. you're not just reporting on the news, you're also sometimes part of it, or you're reporting on things that your friends and colleagues are doing. Yeah. Um, like, I'm, I'm curious, uh, how being a co creator to what you're reporting on influences the way you report or vice versa? Um, yeah, certainly. I like. I, I don't claim not to be biased. I think it's part of it. Like, the, the, like. You're gonna like, link to your stuff. You're like, 
I'm the newsletter creator. I'm going to link yeah. to my stuff when I have a thing. <laughs> but also, I think that like the and some advice is of like things I like and don't like. Having said that, I will happily include things that I disagree with. Sometimes with a bit of editorial, sometimes not. Um, like if they're interesting, I think that that's the my my sort of I, mean, I I read a lot more stuff than goes into the newsletter. It is like I do curate it to that ex to the extent that like a lot of things that I read or get sent don't go go, go in. Um, my barometer is basically is it interesting, and there is a there's a, there's a definitely another thing where like is it interesting like actually it's is it interesting to me? Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, that's sort of what. Like the the feedback from people actually subscribing, sticking with it, like giving me positive feedback about it, is sort of like what other people find those things interesting as well. I'm not claiming to like cover everything or include everything. Like, turns out the internet is just too big for a <laughs> what what is a, a side project of of like from of one person. Um, but there's a bunch of other things I do as well to sort of avoid, I guess, more agrarian agra 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 like problems. So. I don't really cover news exactly. I, I like, oh, look, there's a press release for new product has been launched. Probably don't care. Um, or, or these people acquired these people. Oh, yeah. Or, or this person's joined this company. Or like the sort of the industry news side of things is not what the newsletter does at all. Um, mm -hmm. If you actually look, and only a few people have ever actually done this, like, like told me they've spotted this. It's like the, the editorial bits never mention people. I noticed that, like when you're linking to um, an article, you don't say so and so of such and such place, I, which I think is kind of nice. It gives I, I, it, a, I, it, it stands on its own. Yeah, it's about is the is the content interesting, irrespective of where, like who, it, 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 like it's not to say that that might not be, like something might not be interesting because it's from Google. On the other hand, something can be interesting without being from Google or Netflix. So, in, absolutely, occasionally companies get um, ref mentioned because that's why that thing is interesting but actually the majority of the time it doesn't mention like the actual like sort of why, why you should read this blurb um that i write doesn't mention people on our companies and that's not to downplay the importance of people or companies sure, it's sure. Just like the thing is the interesting part not the personality absolutely um and, and that's and that's I think so. I was wondering if that was deliberate, and I'm. I it's interesting to hear that. Yeah, you're deliberately highlighting the ideas. Yeah, and I, I think that that also makes it easier, like from like from where I sit in terms of well, yeah, there are some things I'm more familiar with. There are some things that I'm closer to, um, like to include like things from a broader set of like sort of outside my immediate like I'm doing this thing at the moment. Having said that, I bet if you if you sort of mine all of the content from all the news sources, you can sort of you can sort of discover what I was like doing at the time because there'll be a slight uptick in like those things be, like, like being covered. Yeah, more more um, container content or whatever. Yeah, but I, I think over over time, it's like I I, I think when, when the newsletter won't work is basically when I'm not continuing to sort of learn about various different values of next so i like you see sort of the container stuff crop up really early you can see sort of the emergence of serverless you can see the emergence of kubernetes like just in terms of mm -hmm. volume of content and yeah there's totally a bias there where they might be things i was interested in yeah, um yeah. so i'm like i've never you're, really you're, been a, da like a database person or i've never really been a network person like having said that i know people who are and try they like tend to sort of feed me interesting content and I can appreciate reading those things without actually being yeah, having the same network of people to gather it yeah so, and so it's, I think you have a a broad enough range of interests um speaking editorializing myself I would say mm -hmm. I think you have a broad enough range of interests that you create um and curate interesting content just by saying hey look at this interesting stuff as it turns out that what? interesting stuff as a service is something people want the the like DevOps as a banner has been purposefully broad from the start, and I think that like for some people they want that like concrete definition that will never change. Versus actually the conversations we were we were having like at like the first few DevOps days, like whether it was the like Gent one or Hamburg or like San Francisco or like the 
super early innings versus the conversations that those people are having now or the uh, or, or are happening at those events now things have moved on and that's yeah. good that's a good thing like not only is the community learning like other things are happening at the same time and yeah. i think i like so the newsletter now is totally different partly because i am partly because the conversation is yeah and that's and that kind of brings us to like i'm thinking you speak at um, a lot of tech conferences and that kind of gives, and not just talking about your talk, but also talking about the conversations you're having there and the articles that come out of and the talks that come out of conferences. Um, obviously that gives you a lot of material for the newsletter. I'm just kind of curious, like, is there a cause and effect chicken and egg here? Like how did you start speaking at conferences and like, how do you decide what to talk about it and how does that tie in with the newsletter? Um, good question. I guess, so I was, I I was doing bits of conference stuff before I was doing the newsletter. Um, not a not a huge amount, but I I think I sort of fell into doing like the odd sort of like meetup. Um, and actually, is nearly like sort of like first or second job type territory um, when I lived up in Newcastle. Um, mm -hmm. Partly, I knew a few people out like sort of in Brighton. I remember. Uh, sending an email to Andy Budd, who at the time ran the uh, Brighton New Media mailing list. Uh, he now runs like Clear Left, basically a design agency in the UK mm -hmm. that's sort of like pretty well known. Uh, and I said, hey, this thing's really good, but I don't live in Brighton, but I know some people who do, but like, how, how did you get it going in Brighton? And he said, oh, well, we just sort of did it. And I was like, ah, oh, well, I live in Newcastle and set up something similar. Um, I, I wrote my own mailing list program, which <laughs> was really, like this was back when I was more stupid than I am now, uh, and ran a mailing like ran the local mailing list for a little while. Like um, I used to organize gigs like sort of before uni at uni, um, and getting more into tech, it was sort of e it was an easy step for me to go like, oh well, I can organize a, like sort of local meetups. I go along to like smaller meetups and things, um, and if you're doing that and you're trying to bootstrap that, like being able to talk turns out to be useful because you always not... need a speaker. You don't always have a speaker. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I think some of it was just sort of falling into it. Some of it was then, uh, I I think I appreciated the sort of the, the ability to travel um, like in a way that I couldn't do otherwise, um, mm. either in terms of like, of time or affording money like that that was not within my reach or budget to start with um and that like flexibility came from actually well actually if i but if i can do a talk some like that's easier to do and it's it just sort of spiraled really i think um i found i've met lots of interesting people that gives me more things to think about um yeah the, the when it comes to the newsletter like the, there's definitely a a theme of content i like the DevOps community as a whole has been amazing at sharing. I mean, like the if you look through the like the the sort of corpus of content that's even just around DevOps days mm -hmm. over the past like seven or eight years, it's amazing. It's an incredible resource. And actually having that one banner has put all of that in one place. Like the fact that actually the model of DevOps days has, has meant that most of those things can be recorded, the like the videos and the sharing and the slides is sort of pretty like it's easy to find something interesting there and that i think has also spread into other events near like next to those because then if, it, like, if uh, it's set up as a model like of course you publish your content then that's it kind of influences conferences to keep doing that and not putting it behind a paywall or anything yeah and i think then like more recently i certainly like well what i'm doing now to a degree obviously new but like the i'm at like from the and you know sort of moving to a software vendor there's there's a like having like a marketing content like that actually people that it like reinforces your product reinforces your brand is great having that come from people who are actually practitioners who are actually tr already trusted by that community and end um, users who don't work for so the vendor more, yeah it's so much more powerful than like the sort of pure marketing sales thing for the for practitioner communities um, and before that, the, and the government was, and the work we were doing there, a lot of it was about making government more open, making it more like accessible, 
um, actually pointing out we had really interesting technology challenges and wouldn't you want to come and work for your government? Um, us being super visible was was part of, was was strategy, not tactics. Um, and, and being super and, visible is so so valuable for people who are trying to hire. <laughs> yep, and so and I, I've never done it as like quote unquote part of my job, um, but I found it useful for whatever other things I'm doing. Often, actually, as a design tool, I often mm-hmm. like use uh, the ability to talk to an audience and get feedback from that audience to talk about something that I'm thinking about doing. And there's the there's the validation of that from the, like from being accepted, i.e. like you submit a, t- a talk and it gets accepted. Therefore, there's validation that the thing you want to talk about is interesting. There's also the validation of like fee- and input into like a design process from an audience. So and I think I've also seen, and I think it might've been you actually, I definitely have seen people who've worked at like Chef and Puppet and whatnot, sit down at a DevOps days, propose the topic configuration management, and then sit down and they don't talk. They just let everyone else talk and they're like, free market research. This is fantastic. Yeah, I've never actually done that, but like the, I tend to be a bit more pointed. But yeah, like it, it's just take that, but it's, it's kind of a take the totally pulse true. of what the community wants to talk about. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Um, oh, okay. So by the way, quick sidebar on the topic of DevOps. Uh, you do not camel case it for DevOps Weekly, at least. And I, I, for DevOps days, I don't capitalize any of that, and I put it all in one string. And I feel like this is kind of one of those touch points, you know, flashpoints in our community. Like, what's your opinion about the camel casing? Um, I think in the same way as, like, so DevOps as as a thing is, is is marketing in the in the purest best sense. It's <laughs> basically a word, an invented word that brought together a lot of people and still does do. Um, I could like the you, like Patrick didn't camel case it, therefore no one else should do. Um, however, people do, like I, I've lost that dis- discussion based on like number of times, just like on this is what people are doing on the internet elsewhere, and I'm like, but everyone can be wrong, and that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I, it doesn't. It doesn't. I don't let it bug me because uh, that would drive me crazy. You would. You like the 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 other areas you'd have to go down the sort of same rabbit hole for is, is quite large. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I'm st- I'm stubborn and, and I I'm, I probably won't change it. Um, <laughs> there's there's a pull request uh, on a government publication somewhere where uh, I I'd, I'd I'd written the original draft. It ended up as. Uh, uh, low case. So I was like, ha, ah, yes, the, 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 the UK government's usage of DevOps is correct. Um, <laughs> after, after I left, someone uh, changed, changed that. And I, I had to go back and sort of, but their, their argument for doing so was that DevOps is a, pop, is a portmanteau is, and it's not. It's a, it's a single made up word. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking far too much about Canopic. I, I'm not bothered about no, I just it's it's just it, it entertains me because it's these little rabbit holes we can go down, you know. It's just funny. Yeah. Um, but speaking of like debates we can have, I went to go check for purposes of this podcast. I went to go look up when that recent adventure we had um in Amsterdam was, and I was a little horrified to see it was fall 2015. Um, because that seemed it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. It was, you know, a little bit ago. Mm-hmm. But when we did Velocity Debate Club, remember when uh, Courtney Nash had us, uh, they, I think they had like, I don't know, a slot to fill or something like last minute at Velocity in yep. Amsterdam. And uh, we'll link to this in the show notes because it was super funny. We um, we were discussing whether containers and microservices were good or bad for your business. And the entertaining part was um, we started out with me defending them and you dismissing them. And then we switched sides halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> It's. I forgot the name. It's a sort of style of debating, and I think it like. It's yeah, useful. It, it. it reinforces the whole like, like different like taking different sides. I think tell it teaches you, like, a lot about a topic. You're like, mm-hmm. and yeah, if people are going to have like sort of strong feelings sometimes. That's fine. If if you're if you practice on the your ability to take both sides of an argument you're likely to then have more empathy for someone when you actually genuinely do sit on one side 
um, and yeah. when you have strong like really strong views and would find it harder to argue like the other side You're, like you can sort of think well yeah but like actually i can start thinking about it i can force myself to think about it from your side and if you're trying to win an argument on the internet then that's not super important if you're actually <laughs> trying to like to come to a consensus or learn something then like i think it's a really useful skill and yeah it's, it's, uh, who knew it would it would be quite as much fun i think even the even, like no no one left the, the pe people seem yeah. to rate it quite highly um yeah. i think it yeah, wasn't just good like, fun for us yeah people people like that sorry i have an attack kitten trying to attack the blinds here <laughs> here we could we can have attack kitten can be on the podcast briefly no kitty um <laughs> so but the reason i brought that up is because i thought it was kind of interesting to ponder now it's two years later. I'm wondering, and I didn't go back and I'm not even sure if there is a video of it. There probably is. I didn't go and try to watch it, but I'm just curious how your thinking has evolved because I mean, fill us in. You just joined Docker. You just joined Docker in like early 2018. And that's probably of interest to people. Like, where do you think the the containers discussion is now? Like what paint a picture for us? Um, so I think, I guess I'm like, answering a few of those questions. Like when containers now are, are are in that sort of messy period where it's not about containers, and I, I think like the people like a word and attaching lots of things to a word, that's fine. And but actually, like where Docker the company sits today is actually like yes, there's this technology. Yes, the, there's this sort of buzz. These these like People have found loads of different ways of, of making the, like this sort of like fine like doing things with the technology that do, like Docker sort of shipped. Um, mm -hmm. Docker, the company, is then trying to make a business, like build mm -hmm. an actual like business around helping like ultimately large large organizations like yeah. modernize their their technology, their infrastructure, their applications. Um, yeah, and and yeah, there's for sure. huge there's a load of like just gnarly problems there that are not about containers they're not about <laughs> like and i i i think sometimes it's useful to talk about like impl the implementation detail stuff the sort of and like there's a lot of really smart people working on a whole bunch of like sort of whether it's kernel level things whether it's like the sort of next layer up um a lot of the the fundamental building blocks of like how we like what technology is going to look like next um I'm not actually one of those people. I'm like my, like just in terms of my background, my interests, I'm like, they're not the things that I get really excited about. Um, I'll happily geek out about some of it, but like, I think how they come together to form like higher level, like more user facing, more business facing things, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of interesting. And that's, and that's why I joined Docker like specifically as a product, as a product manager as well. I actually, I'd said Docker's got like all these like, bits of technology that lots of people are using and actually a like product set in the sort of docker enterprise edition stuff that like large companies are adopting mm -hmm. and how can all of that work better together how can it go like faster for everyone um and i think like similar to sort of i and my i've had a lot of experience in the sort of the open source back sort of community um and then worked for two sort of companies with deep open source roots mm -hmm. and how you get like how we scale up open source, like with like sort of like new technology companies, is one of those sort of really interesting pro problems um, that I'm personally interested in. I think is important for the sustainability of open sources in general, um, and the sort of a circle to be squared there. That's yeah, like... and that's that's really interesting to me too because obviously you've worked now at a couple of vendors that do really foundational, really fundamental, really important open source. And yet there's also a business model there. And if you're working on product stuff, um, or if you're working on the customer, you know, enterprise facing product stuff in particular, like how do you decide which stuff is, you know, free open source, um, you know, what's, what's Moby and what's Docker? Like, how do you make that? How do you draw that line? How do you decide from a product? point of view what I mean, I'm, I'm yeah I'm, I'm obviously new new at docker so i can't really speak about like sort of previous things there sure, but i sure. think a, a big part of it is like open source is strategic not 
not tactical. Mm -hmm. So like, what's the like, what's the most benefit to the people who will actually like give you some benefit back? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that the most benefit might be like actual money, actual revenue, actual direct revenue, mm -hmm. and open sourcing the sort of the things that like are going to give you direct revenue might be a bad idea. Having said that the biggest benefit to something being open source might actually be a huge bit like big user community that oh, yeah. actually I mean Docker's, Docker's and, buzz in the ecosystem is is undeniable it's and, like a, it's a gravitational force <laughs> and i think that like those are the arguments for and against are often a, a contextual like if if you're a, a very large company versus a, a, a sort of a startup that's actually trying to like make a business then the arguments are different um, I think uh, Luke Luke Knees, um, sort of the founder, um, like of Puppet and sort of good friend. He's wrote some really good posts more recently. Um, I'll try to dig out the links and we can add them into the the notes because, like, and obviously he's got a huge amount of experience there, a huge amount of hindsight as well, um, mm -hmm. and made a lot of decisions um, throughout Puppet's life of like deciding well puppet was as it was open source puppet was licensed under one model puppet changed its license puppet, some parts were uh were open source later like the sort of like the thought processes i think uh, as an industry we're still learning what that looks like i mean i we've had obviously open source companies for a while but up until very recently they weren't public the previous generation of sort of of those companies were all I mean, like MySQL AB was like huge, but obviously it was acquired. Everything sort of a lot of the and like that might have been the best thing for those companies, but as a community, we lost the data. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, public companies have to provide information about how they're actually working, um, and we're starting to see open source software companies go public. So the Hot and Works. Um, Cloud Era, like the um, Mongo, uh, mm -hmm. like there's a couple of others now. Like there's sort of a couple of others on this, maybe on the coast. But like, we're starting to, we'll have, de we'll suddenly start having data in a few years that we never had before about like the open source mo like model for companies. Um, and that's that's really interesting too because you just mentioned a couple of companies that definitely, uh, if we think about like a Gartner hype cycle. Um, you know, big data, uh, however we want to put it, is something that we were pretty hyped up about a few years ago. And I don't know if we got to disillusion disillusionment or not, but we definitely are like, yeah, okay, data, that's definitely important. It's part of the overall, oh, now we're going to be excited about IoT or whatever. Um, I'm kind of wondering, like, yeah, there you go, compute on the edge, you know, fog, whatever. Yeah. I'm like, do I want my computing in the fog? I don't even know. But that kind of, it makes me wonder, like, is there a relationship to be teased out there between um, where on the hype curve something is and when, as an open source business model, it actually makes sense? I don't have an answer for that. I'm not sure that's I, even a question, but I'm curious. Hmm. I think I there's lots of people who have pointed at open source is where innovation is happening. Um, and then obviously, com like open source companies invariably try and like capitalize on that. Um, but also at the same, I think that that lifts open source, but and also results in like products with features that large organizations need. And a lot of that, I mean, like the the sort of the current state of like large scale IT is this. There's so much, that, so many things that can be improved by things that we sort of broadly <laughs> speaking know the answer to. Yeah. But actually implementing that at scale in a highly regulated environment in an, in organizations I mean, like coming back to the sort of devops topic where organizationally they're not set up to take advantage of how people have been using technologies so mm -hmm. a lot like so much of the sort of microservice conversation isn't about technology it's about the people and teams and independence a lot of people will say actually from a technology standpoint it's sort of terrible uh like you're introducing latency all the, all over the place you're, you're now managing <laughs> so many additional components you, you've added all this operational complexity but complexity um, is fun gareth come on <laughs> but there's also the, and, but the flip side of that is like you've you've reduced the complexity f from the perspective of an individual team that can now work far more independently mm -hmm. um you've moved complexity around that yeah. and 
like, like when, Kim Jones likes to talk about conservation and complexity. <laughs> yep. And it, when you can make those trade-offs, so it's actually, yeah, I can pay the higher operational cost for a higher like developer sort of team autonomy throughput thing. Like you, you can reason about like technologies, architectures, platforms, and that the a lot of those things assume that like that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of those things assume that like actually changing your team structures is is trivial, right? Um, and if it's like a twenty person company ultimately. And you're growing. Well, you're not changing your team structure all the time because you're growing. Yeah. Um, what worked at 15 people and are, doesn't work at 20, what works at 20 doesn't work at 25. If you're a huge, big, large organization and you've been there for 50 years or several hundred years, like the UK <laughs> government, like, that's like that change of your organization in order to take advantage of technologies, like in the same way as they're used elsewhere in much more fluid places, is near on impossible. So the like question you is, can't can, just, you can't just reorg the government. Yeah, and can you? So can you take? Can you get some of those benefits in areas where like that change is, is harder? And I think that's a that often when you look at sort of across different companies that are based around open source software, but actually are fundamentally software businesses selling to that audience. That's what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to say everyone needs to pay for this innovation. They're saying like we can get this into more people's hands. That like that can't adopt it, and I think that is part of that hype cycle. It's part of actually, like the the sort of the early adopters don't look like the majority. Um, yeah. And I th I'm going back to sort of uh, the velocity talk I did a few years ago, like that sort of the idea that everyone, the idea that everyone is a software company, um, is sort of interesting because it's easy to say and everyone sort of agrees with it. Um, but then if you say well, what does a software company look like? Um, and you look at Google and you say, well, give or take, they've got like 40% of their headcount, 50% of their headcount um, is in R and D, especially it's engineers, designers, product project people. Um, if you extrapolate that to every company is a software company, and you go, so every company then then has like, let's go for the low ball of 40% of people. That's obviously insane it's crazy it doesn't yeah. work ultimately the, there aren't enough software engineers in the in the us to staff like the FTSE 200 FTSE 100 like oh yeah. like we need other like models that scale better for companies that are not going to be first they're not going to be the early adopters well and sometimes people like to say fill in the blank is software and you can make that argument, but it's also people and it's also deliverables and it's also end users. Like if you do, if what you produce is cars or insurance or government, software is a huge part of that. And software yep. is also not your entire raison d'etre. Yep. And you've also got this sort of spread of like, yeah, yes, on one hand, there are conversations going on about like, Sort of the future is serverless or the future is service meshes or the future is service meshes in serverless environments um are we over like, unikernels by the way i feel like the unikernel hype came and i haven't heard as much about it lately can we have yeah, serverless unikernels like i don't know do, do unikernels have to I'm, be a, 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 an evolutionary dead end i don't think they have to be but i think like well we, we'll ha we'll ha we'll all always have these out there conversations. On the other hand, there are there are there are large organizations like spending an awful lot more money than people are spending on any of those things on like getting onto virtualization. And, oh, like, I know. Not, on, not only are they spending loads of money, they are going to save loads of money in doing so. They like it's going to free up people. It's going to save money. It's going to make them a lot more flexible than they were before. Yeah, and like, like just those two, like, those two things can totally be happening at the same time in yeah. like the the Absolutely. industry i'm thinking of like a giant airline uh having an outage because of a data center in the southern us and it's like hmm okay if that airline can just lift and shift some stuff into the public cloud they spread out that risk they're much less likely to have that outage they're not going to incur so many losses because of something like that and that's kind of orthogonal to whether or not they are running all of that with functions as a service or if they maybe lift and shift whatever their web sphere and sadness is into some containers and stick it in the cloud and then keep iterating in their new product lines. Yeah, there's, there's like the, 
I think the messy problems of how you change like organizations and, and software at, like in environments like that are I mean, to me at least like, a lot more interesting than than just the pure technology conversations. I like I I like hanging around with loads of different people, and like some of the people I really like respect are just like they they're just into the technology for nearly for its own sake, not like no, no, not quite but nearly, and there can be a lot of fun. And the flip side of that is that, like I I also have friends who are like I just do the people stuff. I just like I I'm actually mainly working on like sort of classic service management like and and like these are the improvements we're making and i like i i like all of those things like maybe not all, all at the same time and i think that's the that, and that's how i've ended up sort of being interested in the whole devops community the banner the newsletter the rest of it is because the work they're like they were the people who came together they were all sort of like often generalists they were like people are often sort of are doing different things like at different times or they've moved from one place to another and like taken more responsibility or they've gone from sort of hip places to like and like sort of large sort of messy enterprise organizations um like or, or vice versa i think that yeah. that that's interesting and to me it's like the, those people are trying to go like oh yeah like the like one one moment you're working at etsy and the next you're working at like a sort of large big bank Mm -hmm. um and yeah i think like from those people come interesting insights about like that thing we were doing here is totally relevant here and basically you can just do it in both like or actually no we we tried the same thing here and it didn't work and those stories are really interesting yeah and you keep bringing us those stories and so that i think that more than anything else, the fact that the newsletter does a really good job, or you do a really good job in the newsletter of finding the interesting to, and cutting edge technological advances and the practitioner stories and the analysis of how these changes in the industry are affecting people and people are affecting them. Like that, I think that's why I keep reading the newsletter. It's like, it has a really well, good, you have a really good um, broad, with depth but broad perspective there. Yeah. And and the reality is people are writing really good there. I mean like as a as a broad community, like people are writing really good quality books. I mean like there's this I I think I was saying to someone like I I basically collect links during the week. People send me things, I see them on Twitter, I see them in other communities I'm part of and I insta paper things. Mm -hmm. And then once a week I go through and I I always get there and go like oh I didn't really collect many things this week. <laughs> and then I go, ah, wait a minute, there's loads. Um, nice. and, and some weeks are definitely busy than others. Some some weeks are more high quality than others. But it's I'm always super impressed just how much like good stuff people are writing. Like people do I mean, like one of the sort of John Willis sort of like DevOps is like sharing is a sort of fundamental precept of it. And People have been like are sh just constantly sharing, even wh whether or not they consider themselves part of that DevOps community or not now as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. Oh, and I have to ask um, for our listeners because I wrote an ACMQ article and you linked to it in the newsletter. And I think it was like last week or something. Did you link to it because you were coming on my podcast? <laughs> no, <laughs> luckily. Again, I I I found it in, in like the. The topic and the article were really interesting. Uh, it's, I, I think things like that in particular. Like last week, actually, I was really strong on like people and culture side, and the sort of the, there was the post about like sort of experience actually trying to transform an IT team. Um, there was one about swarming. I, I like I I like the technology stuff, but it's really easy to it's easier to find the technology stuff than the good people stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's that's cool. Okay, so we're almost out of time, but I'm I'm thinking like final question, ten thousand foot view. Um, can you give us a picture of the what you see happening since you have you know your finger on the pulse, et cetera, et cetera? Broader industry trends. Where are things? Where where, where is the puck going? You know, what should people be paying attention to and learning from? Like, what's your your broad picture mm -hmm. for early twenty eighteen? What should people be looking at? um i'll be boring and saying co like context i think that you can t you can chase 
technologies, but if you do so with a view to implementing them in like your environment, you'll mm -hmm. you'll always be like you'll you'll never stop. It won't be like the fact if you're chasing the technology, whether that's like whatever that is, that's Kubernetes, that's Docker, that's serverless, mm -hmm. that's what, like you'll always be chasing the next technology. And you'll miss the fact that you're like, well, what's the business problem you're solving? What's the context you're in? Like, is that the is that relevant to where I am right now? Like, mm -hmm. and I think stepping back and like, like I, I would like to say the te the technology industry will reach a certain point, and like, what we'll do is is maybe step back a little bit and like sort of have more grown up conversations about context and solving problems. I'm not sure that's actually what will happen. Um, people like their shiny toys <laughs> yeah and I, and I don't think i like i'm not against shiny toys um i like had enough dances there and like i think the technology like pushing the technology envelope forward is really important um but i do think some of the like conversations about where they're useful are better driven by like a sort of like a passing interest at least and like some information about like the business the context like what organization are you in? What what problem are you solving? Um, actually, what like, problem are you trying to solve? <laughs> yeah, I think it's not, and 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 where, like, yeah, like having the same problem in two different places, like mm -hmm. might they might want the same answer, they might want different answers, and without that context, you'll again you're just chasing the technology, and you'll always be unhappy then because I think you'll then you'll be chasing the next technology afterwards. Yeah, um, that is that's a like, really good insight. Getting, getting as as an industry, it was getting better at sort of technology that stops. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of like it's it's good enough, it's stable, and because we we know that happens, like, and there's quite a lot of technology that like has sat for a long time, mm -hmm. that basically does its job. Large organizations in particular will have like a lot more like bits of technology running than they do like sort of developers working on them. Um, mm -hmm. I think we sort of ignore that discipline a bit, like in terms of sort of the modern tooling, modern technology. Right. Um, like, how, like, what would, like, what sort of, maybe what tools and what technologies or processes or what, like, would we need to build, sort of, to build technology that lasts like 10 years, frankly? Um, <laughs> like, it's sort of like yeah, some environments are better there than others. Some I mean, like some. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, kind like, of, I'm thinking of like the space program. You know, they yeah, build I mean, stuff and they send it off to space, and years later, it's still reporting back, and you're like, yeah. "Wow, that still works." And the fact that we're surprised and like amazed by that is sort of depressing. <laughs> um, and like it's it's and it's possible. Um, and I think a lot of the like sort of arguments for not doing that elsewhere is it's really like how that's done is really costly yeah but actually it's really costly because it's niche um and are there tools and technologies that can be applied there that could mean that we could all do that and you see like, and like when you look at the sort of st stability of like the jvm sort of style applications mm -hmm. versus um like ruby on rails like which i was like i'm a huge big fan of like Ruby on Rails. It's like I just had a big impact technologically. I did a whole bunch of work there. But coming back to a Rails application after two years that's not been worked on by anyone else is actually there's a there's a burden there. There's a trade-off that's been made to make that like able to go. And it's like studying those differences, like what led to that? It wasn't it wasn't by design. It wasn't just a trade-off. It was like what properties of software would lead to things that we could just build and would keep running. So I think what um, I'm hearing is a conference talk you're going to be giving in 2018, <laughs> probably at like Monktober, you know, Monktoberfest or something, and it's going to be entitled "Built to Last," and it'll be about building software for the long haul. I'd I'd love to be expert enough to give that. Um, I think like it's. But this doesn't yeah. be, I mean, I feel like this isn't necessarily expert in that you did it. It's more mm. a survey of the practices that can be observed, you know, kind of a, a field study, if, if you will. Yep. No, I certainly think it's an interesting area. Like, nice. Whether I, whether, I whether, whether, I, I, whether I have time to actually do, do more, more than ramble on a podcast, we'll see. 
Well, it, and this is what always happens is we run out of time and we say that it's going to have to be another podcast because I think that would be a very worthwhile other podcast. So uh, to wrap up, let's say community and event stuff. Um, I'm in the next few weeks, I have two weeks at home now Then I'm going to be in Bergen, Norway for BoosterConf. And then I'm actually going to be in London just for a couple of days for a party um, community event thing at the new Microsoft Reactor space there. Uh, that's March 15th. And then I'll be at SRECon and SF running a Kubernetes workshop on March 26th. And that just takes us to the end of March. Oh, hashtag vendor life. Like <laughs> travel season is starting up again. Oh, but what is your what is your uh, next couple of months look like, Gareth? Oh, I'm not too much travel, partly down to the new job, apart from sort of internal things. I'm I'm I work well often with the Cambridge team, but we've also got an office in Paris. So I'm going to get a trip to Paris, see some folks there. Um, uh, and then back to London. Uh, yeah, start of March, sort of seventh for QCon. So okay. I'm uh, I'm helping run uh, with Anne Curry a ethics track at QCon, which has been well, it was one of those things where we were like, this will be good, and everyone was like, are you sure? And now everyone's super excited about it. So we're we looking will forward to a, that. We'll put a link in the show notes to uh, QCon London yeah. and your track with Anne Curry because that will be peop something people will want to check out. Right, yeah, awesome. We didn't, we didn't even talk about that topic, but yeah, it's certainly eth ethics and technology is again like separate to the sort of. Well, I said I'm sort of maybe getting more into like a lot of the separate to pure technology things. Like the, I think the like ethics for technologists is a big. Uh, it's it's going to become a more important pressing issue if if as an industry we're going to own our destiny. Yeah, like, yeah. We're 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 surprisingly powerful, and. <laughs> the companies that were like sort of part of are increasingly powerful and i think like comes that comes with a whole bunch of responsibility and, and eventually regulation if we don't actually get our act together um so I was how, having a how evil are the robots going to be <laughs> like everything from that yeah and i think there's but i was having a sort of like a lack of an ethical education for technologists a lack of an ethical sort of conversation anywhere mm -hmm. i think means that we're totally unprepared for those conversations <laughs> yeah um, no kidding i mean i i took the appetizer sampler of liberal arts classes just because i wanted to but my at least when i did my computer science program it did not have a lot of requirements around you know learning to be a well-read or you know reflective human being like that just mm. it was barely time for that in the curriculum yeah and no, well, like lots of things, I think it's like the, like, I think it's le it's probably less about the sort of the pure education side, and actually, like, because that's like having a load of new engineers and junior engineers, like, with an understanding of that would be good. On the other hand, you still have this, you still have our generation <laughs> of people who will run, out. so that we like we might build the crazy like evil robots. <laughs> and then they would wipe out all these ethical technologies the, the ethical juniors so, would be like uh we learned that you should consider yes but I, I think there's i think that's one of the areas where like conferences have a like an interesting avenue to get to like a lot of people um and okay, ultimately then the grown-ups like, already working in the industry might listen to you might listen to Anne, and might uh pay attention to this well, eth ethics track <laughs> the, the nice thing with the ethics track is there's we've got some real experts that they can come listen to not and me and Anna, me and Anna are just cur cur helping curate <laughs> well i will look forward to i did see that your program is posted so i will link to that in the show notes and and tweet about it and tell people they need to come check that out um Let's see, we also have open CFPs for lots of DevOps days, um, including DevOps Days Minneapolis, which I run. Uh, the GopherCon CFP, um, link in the show notes, closes March 15th. The conference is August 27th to 30th. And uh, there's discount codes for a lot. ADO 2018 will get you a discount on a lot of DevOps days, ChefConf, GopherCon. So, if you have an upcoming conference you'd like to see promoted on ADO, you can fill out the handy form, arresteddevops.com slash comp. So let's see, um, links to anything we want people to check out. Gareth, do you have anything you want people to go check out? Oh, um, apart from the ethics track. Uh, oh, what, I've been hacking on something recently called uh, KubeVal. 
So basically a uh, val local a local validator for Kubernetes configurations. Yes. Um, if people are, people are playing with Kubernetes, uh, feel free to have a look at that. It's sort of one of my pet projects at the moment. Nice. We will put a link in the show notes to that. And uh, speaking of hacking on fun projects, um, I'll put a link in the show notes to this IoT dev kit that they gave us at our uh, Microsoft Cloud Developer Advocacy Summit. And it's actually, I finally started mm -hmm. playing with it. And it's really cool. So that's something to check out. And um, I also want to signal boost. There's a Mail Ally Summit in New York on March 29th um, that uh, uh, Natasha Green and some other folks are running. So I'll put a link for that too, because I think it's, a lot of times, um, those of us in tech may have noticed that tech is full of dudes, and most of them are well-intentioned and wonderful humans who would love to make tech better for those who aren't dudes. So um, having the uh, insights from fellow male allies will, I think, be really helpful there. So yeah, um, Gareth, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. This was super fun. Yeah, no, it's been good. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, head over to arrestedDevops.com slash DevOps dash weekly for this episode's show notes. And the site also has our newsletter, Patreon, all the Arrested DevOps stuff you could possibly want. Visit arrestedDevops.com slash iTunes. Leave us a review in the iTunes store. I'm told that helps people find the podcast. I don't know how these things work, but uh, I'm Bridget at Bridget Kremhout. We're Arrested DevOps. And remember, there's always DevOps in the banana stand. <laughs>